a love offering at church by the dogs, right? It reminds me of a Christmas Eve service we had here one time. Sandy was sitting over there in the chair with her dog. I forget which dog it was, but another dog came from the congregation and they had a brawl up here on, <laughs> on the platform on Christmas Eve. You never can tell about dogs. I know that the word dog spelled backwards is God, and I know there's lessons there. Sometimes I can't understand for the life of me what those lessons are. All right, let me make an announcement or two before we get started in our study. We've got our regular meetings going on this week. Now, right now, there's no class on Tuesday evening um, here at the training center, but coming up on the 5th of September, I'm going to be starting an Alpha series online through uh, Bridge the Gap Ministries. We've got little flyers that I promptly forgot since Mary's not here uh, to put out, but there's a website that you can get on to, and it'll be held on Tuesday nights live from 8 o'clock or 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. every Tuesday night um, through the Bridge the Gap Ministries, and I've got the information for you. We'll put it out in our in our newsletter and that sort of thing for those of you that are interested in it. Also, um, I've pretty much made up my mind, the Lord's made up my mind basically, that I'll be starting a, can I turn it up? Well, I can turn me up. <laughs> Maybe I ought to talk into the microphone, how's that? On May 6th, I think it's Wednesday night, uh, I'll be starting a family class uh, here in the training center. We'll be dealing with issues such as marriage issues, parenting issues, that sort of thing. Just a general family class. Everybody's welcome because all of you are part of a family. That'll be September 6th. Did I say May 6th? I thought I turned it up. I turned the volume up, but not the content, right? Yeah, that'll be September 6th. It'll be on a Wednesday in the evening at 7 o'clock uh, here in the training center, for those of you that are interested in that. Also, Mary wanted me to announce for you ladies, uh, next ladies' luncheon is September 30th. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the building in there for you ladies uh, to sign up if you're interested. And I think... The next uh, recovery support training class that we're going to be doing uh, for counselors will be September 9th. Uh, that's a Saturday, Saturday morning, and I'll be teaching a recovery and grace uh, class uh, beginning at 9 o'clock in the training center as well. All right, those are all the announcements that I can remember. I want to get us back to our study in the last chapter of Ephesians. We're in a chapter chapter 6 of Ephesians, and continuing our study on Paul's description of a new lifestyle, a brand new way to live, a new lifestyle in grace and truth, a new lifestyle based on the fact that we are brand new creations in Christ, that God has done something for us we couldn't do for ourselves. He made us brand new persons. And that brand new person you are has been given a new lifestyle. See, the good news, the real heart of the gospel, or the good news, is that God's already done everything necessary to make you a brand new person in Christ. When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, that's what he was talking about. Everything's finished. Everything's done. So reality is that you're no longer the same person you've always thought you were. When you accept that good news by faith, you begin to experience the reality of this new life that Paul is describing here in these last chapters of his letter. Now, true to form, I have to warn you all each time because we're dealing with 
what comes to mind is adult material here. You know when it says adult content on movies and that kind of stuff? It says it's kind of a misnomer, I know, because adult content means that, technically, that this is only suitable for adult audiences. Well, I could label the last half of every one of Paul's letters as adult content. Because here he's no longer talking about what God has done for you. He is now talking about what God intends to do through you for other people. And that requires adulthood. It requires the technical term of sonship from the Greek word huios, meaning a full-grown adult child. So if you're going to act like an adult child of God, not a little baby, baby Christian who doesn't know who they are, where they came from, what they're doing, doesn't even know how to take care of themselves, doesn't know how to change their own dirty diapers or dress themselves or feed themselves or anything. That's a little baby. Well, Paul's not talking to you as little babies now. He's talking to you as an adult child of God. And it's important that we understand, absolutely vital that we understand who he's talking to when we read these verses. You see, for years I was guilty of, and I'm sure many other people have read these verses simply as a list of commands. Starting back in chapter 4 when he says, I want you to quit lying by speaking truth with everybody. I want you to quit stealing by working and giving to others. I want you to quit slandering people by speaking words that build them up. And going on throughout chapter 5, he gives us one series of commands after another. And for years I looked at these commands from an old covenant perspective, which I'll explain here in a moment, which meant that it was up to me to get the job done. So it was up to me to quit lying and start speaking truth. It was up to me to quit slandering people hating them, forgive them, and build them up. It was up to me to live out these commands. And so naturally, when I looked at those commands, the very first thing that entered my mind was my own knowledge, what I had learned, what I had experienced growing up, my own knowledge of what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was evil. And I began to pick these commands apart. When he says, I want you to quit lying, I began to judge what I said, whether it was lying or not. Is exaggeration lying? How about when you tell those little white lies? You know what I mean by little white lies? Innocent lies like, yes, dear, your hair looks wonderful. No, dear, you're not putting on weight. No, dear, these jeans don't make your hips look big. Is that lying? You see what I got caught up in there? My own knowledge of good and evil trying to figure out what is lying, what isn't lying, why? So I could quit lying. Problem is, it didn't work never does. Because I was approaching these verses, that one command as well, as well as the rest of them, from an old covenant mentality. A legal mentality. A legal mentality starts with a question. Is it right or is it wrong? And as soon as you take one step with that question, is this right or is this wrong? You're under the old covenant and you're on your own. That's what Paul was warning the Galatians about. He said, you fall under one point of the old covenant. You try to live according to your knowledge of good and evil. It's going to kill you. Now, I kind of understood 
that the that what he was saying in these verses was important. Okay, obviously it's recorded in the Word of God. But I couldn't figure out for the life of me how not to live under the old covenant, trying to figure out what was right and wrong, and trying to make myself do what was right and not do what was wrong, even though I failed many times. So I developed this kind of secondary religious philosophy in which I treated grace as mercy and relied heavily daily upon the forgiveness of God. It goes like this. Okay, I know it's wrong to lie. So, when I lie, I get honest with myself and I say, okay, you lied. When I lie, then I quick go to God and say, God, I lied, I'm sorry. I need mercy and I want you to forgive me for my lie. And God says, okay, you're forgiven. Now I'm good to go. And I'm ready to charge hell with a water pistol again and say, from now on, I'm never going to lie again. I don't make it very long, and I lie. I thought I'd never lie again. Okay, I, what I didn't do is I didn't tell, I didn't promise God I'd never lie again. So, God, I know I lied, but I promise you this time. You forgive me and I'll never lie again. I need your mercy, God. Okay. And I feel better. Uh, I'm forgiven. I promise God I'd never lie again. And that was a lie. <laughs> because in less than 24 hours, I lied again. Oh. You see, that? that's a watered down religious lifestyle of mercy. And it doesn't work. The problem is, many Christians, most Christians, fall into that lifestyle because they misinterpret mercy for grace. See, grace is not just God's mercy. Mercy is important, that's good, but that's not grace. Living a lifestyle of grace means you're not doing it. It means God is by His power through His Spirit working in you to do what He's created you to be and do and say. It's His grace working in you. Not your effort according to your own knowledge of good and evil. So if we're going to understand these verses in the latter half of Paul's letters, we're going to have to understand these are written as commands, but they're not intended for us to use them to bolster our own knowledge of good and evil, to live out our life apart from God's grace. We can't do it. I don't care what the command says. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. We've been in the family here the last couple of weeks which I've interpreted for you as simply not change, trying to change your husband because you're not satisfied with the way he is. Or husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. These commands by themselves can do nothing but convict you and prove that you're a failure. That's all they can do. Because they're the law. The purpose of the law was not so that we would know how to save ourselves, how to change ourselves, how to make ourselves better. The purpose of the law was to prove to us that we couldn't do it. That we needed it. God to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So when we study these verses, we don't look at them from a legal perspective of the Old Covenant, do this and live. We look at it from the perspective of the New Covenant, a covenant of grace 
in which God does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Now you've heard me repeat this several times. When we take communion, I always talk about the new covenant and contrast it to the old. The new covenant of grace has three components that Jeremiah lists out for us that we need to trust in. The first component Jeremiah listed in the New Covenant, in the terms of the New Covenant, is God said, I will write my law on your heart and put it in your inward part. Now what that means is simply that God is going to give you the want to and the ability to do what he commands, what he wants. Who's going to do that? God's going to do that. Not you. God's going to do that. He's going to work in you His law. He's going to put it in your heart, the deepest part, the recesses of your subconscious mind, and He's going to cause it to direct your life. The second, He says, you're not going to have need that someone tell you about me, much less about what you ought to do or not do to be a good Christian. You don't need that. That's what you don't, you don't have that need. Why? Because he says, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. He is talking about a close, intimate, personal relationship just between you and him. He's going to tell you what to do. Over the last 35 years, I've done I don't know how many hours of personal counseling and people always come to me and say, what shall I do? What do I do? about my wife? What do I do about my husband? What do I do about my kids? What do I do about my job? What do I do about my life? And my standard answer across the board every time is, I don't have a clue what you ought to do. And I don't. I don't have an idea of what God wants you to do. I'm still trying to figure out what God wants me to do. I ain't got time to figure out what God wants you to do. Besides, he's not telling me what he wants you to do. He's telling you. See, this is what he means in that second term of the new covenant. You will be my people. I'll be your God. There's no one else that has the right to tell you what to do. You've got to hear him. Now, Paul is, even though he hasn't direct, directly addressed that particular subject he has sprinkled throughout his letter references to the personal leadership of the spirit he tells us we are sealed with the spirit he tells us in, in his prayer in chapter 3 for us he prays that we would receive power and be strengthened by his spirit you see the way grace operates is through the spirit of God living inside of you teaching you, directing you, guiding you, instructing you, empowering you. It's through His Spirit that God works in our lives. That's why He tells us in chapter 5, in the last chapter, He tells us to be controlled by the Spirit constantly. Now, the third, perhaps the most glorious term of the New Covenant is that God said, your sins and your iniquities, past, present, and future, all the problems and all the difficulties and all the sins and all the screw-ups you've ever had in your life, God says, I will remember no more. Now, that's amazing. You mean God doesn't look at you and remember how many times you screwed up? You look at yourself in the mirror and you think, oh, I screwed up. I remember when I screwed up doing this, that, or the other. Other people look at you and all they see is the times you screwed up. God doesn't remember any of that. Your sins and your iniquities, I will remember. God can't remember. Why? This is how used to confuse me. I used to think, how could God forget? 
I mean, I've screwed up so many times. I promised him again and again and again I wouldn't do it, and I did it. How could he forget that? What God did on the cross when Jesus was crucified was he crucified the old self-centered sinful person you were. Put that sucker to death once and for all. And raise up a brand new person that you are now who is created in Christ Jesus quickened together with him who has the absolute righteousness of Christ which means he never had you never have sinned you're not sinning now and you never will because you're this brand new person that's how God looks at you he doesn't look at a screw up that's trying to turn over a new leaf no no he looks at one who has the righteousness of his son, Jesus. You're a brand new person. Now the way God looks at you and the way other people look at you may be totally different, isn't it? And the way God looks at you and the way you look at yourself based on what other people say is totally different. The problem's not with what God has done. The problem is with our perception of it. I was sitting on the back porch taking a break yesterday and I looked across the backyard there and there was a big old water oak tree and I noticed a little pattern of bullet holes, a little triangle. And I remember the night I put them in there, just playing around. And I looked at that, that tree and the first thought that popped into my mind, the first picture I saw in my mind was a smiley face, okay, because it two eyes and a mouth kind of formed a smiley face. And I could see a smiley face, and I kept looking at it, and a little while later I saw this ugly face, almost like a skeleton. Reality was, there's three holes in a tree. But what am I doing? I'm making up certain images in my mind, right? Reality is you're a brand new person in Christ, holy and without blame before God, but what do you do? You make up images in your mind of yourself from your past. That's not reality. You're not living in reality, thinking that you're the same old person you've always been. That's not reality. Reality is you're a brand new person created in Christ Jesus. That's reality. Now, I know it's hard for us to grasp that because we make up our own reality. It's like I was making up images out of those three holes in a tree. I know that's a natural process of our mind. That's why Paul told us in chapter 4 to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. That we put off concerning the former conversation the old person we were and we put on the new person. You see, it's that new person that God says, I don't remember him sinning at all because that new person never has. Now, the new covenant of grace is what we live in now. And so when we read these verses, we don't read them as commands to straighten out an old person. We read them as a description of the lifestyle of the new person we are. This is what we're privileged to do. Wives are privileged to respond to their husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands are privileged to love their wives just like Christ. Children are privileged to respect and obey and care for their parents. Parents and fathers are privileged to raise up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You see, these are not commands that are grievous to us. He is describing a new lifestyle that we're privileged to live because we're new people. Now in that light, he goes from the home to the job. In verses 5 through 9 of chapter 5, he talks about 
our new life of faith on the job. You see, many times we compartmentalize in our thinking and we get the idea that this truth, that I'm a brand new person in Christ, that God has done for me what I can't do for myself, that I'm absolutely holy and righteous, this truth is true as long as I'm in church or as long as I'm in a Bible study. But it's not really true when I go home. Well, he's blown that out of the water. And so we say, well, I can leave that faith I don't leave my faith at church. I take it home with me. But you don't leave it at home either. You go to work with it. And that's what he's doing here in these next few verses. I want to read them to you just to give you the, the context. And then we'll try to explain what the lifestyle really looks like that he's describing here for us. In verse 5, he says, Servants or slaves, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Now, he uses the term servants or slaves uh, because of his own perspective of his day to bring it home to us since we don't technically have masters and slaves. We're talking about employees and employers here. Okay, everybody bridge the gap here with me. We're talking about your work, what you do every day when you go to work. He says, first of all, I want you slaves or your employees to go to work in a radically different way than is normal. With fear and trembling, it says in the King James, what that really means is with respect and awe and in singleness of your heart, meaning with a pure motive. So we're going to work respecting our employers with a pure motive, singleness of heart. But then he goes on, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Hmm. Not as eye service as men please. What does that mean? Well, it means a variety of things. One thing is it means doing just enough to get by so that you don't get your butt fired from your job. It means making it look good on the outside when you know it's not really done well. It, may, it means working hard while you're being watched. Who are you seeking to please? Your boss. Whoever signed in your check. That's eye service as men pleasers. He says, not, not, you're not working that way. You're working as those who are serving the Lord, doing the will of God. Now, I know this is a big jump for most people. Most people can understand this kind of terminology with regards to religious activities, religious work in a church or something of that nature. But when it comes to going out working a job as a heavy equipment operator or taking a job in the technical field as a computer analyst or something of that nature, they say, well, that, you know, the Bible really doesn't have anything to do with it. Yes, it does. It has everything to do with it. What we're talking about here, I've titled simply a faith-based work ethic. Now, you hear a lot about the work ethic and people moaning and complaining that Oh, we don't have people that have got a good work ethic in the country, and I understand all that. But what I'm describing for you, what Paul's describing for you here, is a faith-based work ethic, which we'll get to here in a moment. Let me finish up uh, the, the verses. He says, With good will, doing service as unto the Lord, and not to men, knowing, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free, a slave or a master. What's he telling us here? Let's try to get down to the nitty gritty. This is a possibility I want you all to consider applying in your own life. Because you are a brand new person, because of who God has made you to be, you have the privilege 
of developing a faith-based work ethic. Well, what does that look like? Well, they just describe it for us. Well, how do we do this? How do we develop a faith-based work ethic? We study these verses again and say, oh, let's see. I've got to do a good job. I've got to have fear and trembling, which I'm not sure what that means. But it's some kind of respect for this boss that I hate. And it's going to be rough, isn't it? See, you're approaching it from that old covenant now with your own knowledge of what's right and wrong, trying to interpret this description according to your own understanding of good and evil and relying on your own effort, your own strength to do what's right and not do what's wrong. You've already failed. You're doomed. You can't approach it that way. Well, how do we approach it differently? under the new covenant. Remember this, that grace has three distinct motives that lead us in our lives. The first is faith. And that faith is in what God says He's done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. That's where you first start this faith-based work ethic. Is you start not by doing something or not doing something. You start by what you believe about you, number one. If you fail to start there and try to jump way on ahead to what you're going to do now, you're going to miss the boat altogether. Wind up back in the old covenant. Why? Because you've not exercised faith. See, the way you get into grace as a lifestyle is by what you believe. Not by what you do. By what you believe. And when you believe what God says is true about you, what He says He's made you to be, you enter into grace. His work is working in you by faith. For by grace, through faith, are you saved. Now, Okay, I'm going to believe what God says is true about me. He's made me a brand new person created in Christ Jesus. I understand that. I'm also going to believe not only in my own righteousness that comes from God and who I am and that new identity, but I'm also going to believe in what God has me doing, why I'm here, what my life is about. So what he's telling us is, listen, you go to work believing that you're not really working for the man, the person that signs your paycheck. You're really working for God. That's what your life is about. Now, I know it's easy to confuse the two because we love getting paid. We like when people give us that paycheck. We love that. And we feel so secure and so significant and important when we get that paycheck. So it's easy for us to confuse that with God. But it's not God. You see, that paycheck, the money you receive, the reward you receive from your boss, from whoever signs your check, is secondary to God. You're not serving God. The money, you're serving God. Well, how do we do that? Well, I've got a real simple suggestion for you. When you get up tomorrow morning and you get ready to go to work, whatever your work is, doesn't matter. Could be going to school, that's going to work. Could be doing housework, could be pulling weeds, that's work. Whatever your job is, doesn't matter. You get ready to go do that job, Stop and ask yourself the question, why am I doing this? Now, I'm sure if you're like me, there have been a lot of times you had a job to do and you ask, why am I doing this? Because it didn't make so much sense to you. But that's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is get honest with why you're going to work. Especially 
in those jobs you don't like. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the years that hate their job. But they're working, looking for the weekend, looking for that retirement point. But they hate their job. Now I understand. So why are you doing it? They're doing it, and we go to work under those circumstances out of fear. Well, if I don't go to work, I might get fired. If I get fired, I won't get a paycheck. If I don't go to work, they'll dock my pay. If I don't go to work, I can't eat. can't pay my bills. I mean, there's all kinds of threats for not going to work. So we go to work dutifully in fear. Afraid that if we don't go to work, bad consequences are going to happen to us. And that's founded fear because, true to form, you don't go to work, you will get fired. So how do we get around that? I'm going to work in fear. I've got this suggestion. Why don't you ask God what he wants you to do? Ask him. Lord, you want me to go to work? Do you think he's able to answer you? Do you believe he's big enough to tell you what to do? Do you think you can hear him? See, don't just take it for granted. Oh, yeah, I know I'm supposed to go to work. Because, because when you take it for granted, you're going to go to work out of fear. And that's going to cause you a lot of problems. It'll not only disrupt you personally, but it'll create bitterness and resentments and all kinds of struggles and strife with the people you work with and your job and your boss, etc., etc. That's where all the problems come from. Going to work out of fear. Because you have to. Go to work out of faith. Faith that this is where God wants you. Now, when you ask that question, God, is this where you want me? Is this what you want me doing today? Be ready and willing to hear the answer. Because he just might say, no, I don't want you to go to work there today. You talk about fear. Now we got real fear, don't we? Not only fear of not getting paid, but now fear of getting fired. Because God didn't want us to go to work. You think God might ever tell you not go to work? He can tell you anything. He's told people a bunch of weird stuff. Just look in the Bible and see. He told them a bunch of weird things to do and not do. He might have another plan for you that day. He may have another job for you to do on down the road. You don't know. Only God knows. So let's assume, just for argument's sake, you say, God, you want me to go to work today? And he says, yep. You're where I want you. This is what I want you doing. This is how I want you to spend your time and energy. Yep, I want you to go to work. Now, when you go to work under that condition, you have exercised faith. And by the way, it's an exercise. Okay, it's not an intellectual wondering. It's an exercise. That means when God says he wants you to go to work, you get off your butt and go to work. And when you do that, you're exercising faith. You put the ball back in his court. And you say, okay, God, I'm going because I believe this is what you want me to do. Now, exercising that faith, you are serving Christ. You are serving the Lord God. You are doing the will of the Father. Whatever the job is, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, you're doing the will of God. And with the exercise of that faith, there's another little personal benny that you get. And that's called hope. A joyful, confident expectation about your future. 
you know you're going to be okay. Why? Because you're doing what God's called you to do. You're doing the will of the Father. You've exercised your faith, and now you have hope, a joyful confidence in what you're doing, which will free you to actually love the people you work with. Your co-workers. Even your old boss. Never mind the other people you come into contact with. Where did it all start? It started with the exercise of faith in a grace perspective. So a faith-based work ethic is what he's describing here. And he's telling us we have the privilege to go to work for Jesus. We don't have to work for a paycheck. We don't have to work at the whims of other people. We work for God. He's your employer. He's the one with the absolute authority. And he's got you where he wants you to be, and you have confidence in that. You're able to care about other people. And in your caring about other people, including your boss, you do the best job possible. You see, the people who are the best workers are not the workaholics that are trying to, to be men pleasers with eye service. Those aren't the best workers. The best workers are the ones that are doing it as unto the Lord. Doing it and recognizing this is their calling. But he doesn't stop with the workers, the employees. He goes right on in the next verse to talk about the employers. He says, new masters. I'll close with this. He says, you masters, that means employers, people who are in charge of others. You masters, do the same thing unto them. In other words, follow the same principle. What principle are we talking about? We're talking about a faith-based principle. We're talking about whatever you do, whatever you say, is based in trusting God and what he says about you and who he's made you to be, and trusting his spirit leading you in everything you do and say. Masters, do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also in heaven is in heaven. Neither is there any respect of persons with him. There's no partiality here. So to employers... What he's saying is the same thing. You exercise the faith, the foundational, fundamental faith in the gospel of who God has made you to be, recognizing that he has put you in that position for his plan to be fulfilled. And you're serving him. You're not serving your higher-ups. You're not serving the ones you're in charge of. You are serving Christ. A faith-based work ethic. Now, what makes the difference be between that and just looking at these as commands? Let me close with this. A New Testament perspective, a grace perspective of these commands is meant to give you the assurance of who you really are. You see, our faith is not blind, folks. You hear a lot about having blind faith. Well, you just got to trust God, and, and regardless of whether you can see how it's going to work out or not, I understand all that. But our faith truly is not blind. We have the revelation of the Word of God Himself. And what He's written down here in black and white, He has written down so we can recognize when we're living in his grace when i'm living in his grace i go to work in faith i experience his hope and i'm capable of loving other people around me you see that's why he's writing this he's not writing this to tell us what to do and to give us direction that we can follow under our own energy no no, no. back up and include that faith element but start first of all with the faith in who god has made you to be Remember, you're no longer the same person you've always thought you were. That is not who you are. You are a brand new person created in Christ with a brand new mission, 
a brand new work to be done that only you can do, that God has placed you here to do. Your job is part of the work God has planned for you. You do it heartily as unto the Lord with a hope that you can't lose and you're free to be Christ to others and love them, even on your job. So he's applied for us the gospel across the board. First of all, in our general living, in those four commands in chapter 4, he went home with us, applied the gospel in our home life. Now he's gone to job or to school with us to apply the gospel there. It's the same gospel applied in all areas. And the result is the same. The result is a transformed life. When you're following God, when you're trusting Him, when you are actually looking to Him in faith, then no matter what you do, in word or deed, you bring glory and honor to Him. No matter what the job is. You don't have to have a world-famous, important job. You can have the most menial task in the world and do it under the Lord. Here recently, in the last month or so, the Lord has cut back my schedule. So I'm not running all over the countryside teaching. He kept me here at the ranch. And I asked him, I said, Lord, what does this mean? It was quite a change for me. My job radically changed. And I felt guilty for not doing the things I was doing because those are obvious things for God, going around teaching classes. He said, no, I want you to stay put. I want you to mow this grass. I want you to pick up cigarette butts and dog turds. I want you to clean the place up. I want you to be my gardener. I thought, hmm, this is strange. How in the world am I going to get the great things done for Jesus that I envisioned I should do. He said, let me do the work. You do what I tell you to do and believe who you are. I'll get the job done. I'll get it done. And he has and he will. That coincides with what he told me about two months ago when I was praying, asking about what was going on. He said, all he said, two words. They had kind of a redneck twang to them. Watch this. Watch this. He didn't tell me to do anything. He said, open your eyes and watch this. Watch me work. And he's been working. He continues to work in all your lives. And I, I see it. I enjoy it. Faith-based work ethic. Based on faith and who God has made us to be. Trusting Him in everything we do. Let's pray. Father God, as we come into your presence, I thank you the simplicity of the gospel. I thank you, Father, that you've not made it difficult for us to follow you and your leadership in our lives. That you've put your spirit within us to comfort us, teach us, to remind us, to direct us. I ask, Father, that you would continue to work now in our hearts and minds. I ask that you would continue to lead us in our daily activities that we might bring forth honor and glory to your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.